The last thing Chinese leaders want is to be isolated at the international stage. When other countries learn to live with the virus, I think China will find that the zero tolerance strategy unsustainable. Hello and welcome to G Zero World. I'm Ian Bremmer, and today we are talking about the biggest global risk of 2022. Could it be Russia and Ukraine? Maybe deep political divisions in the United States. Maybe it's big tech. Not again. I, I am so over this. It's yep. That's right. COVID. But this time we dive deep into how China's current coronavirus strategy could pose a big threat to the global economy. President Xi Jinping's zero COVID policy, yes, zero, has done well so far to keep the virus at bay. But Omicron, a variant said to be at least four times more contagious than Delta, could soon make his strategy highly ineffective. More lockdowns and staffing shortages in China will lead to supply chain disruptions, higher inflation, and greater political instability worldwide. I speak to Yanzhong Wang. He's senior fellow for global health at the Council on Foreign Relations, and he thinks China will soon have to learn how to live with the virus. Then, do you need some extra cash after the holidays? You want to win a cow? I know you want to win a cow. Well, maybe it's time to get vaxxed, finally. A global spike in COVID infections has led governments to bring back incentive programs for the unvaccinated. But first, Omicron has arrived. And with it, a new challenge in how governments and individuals deal with COVID-19. But despite mounting concern, this is not March 2020. The new variant is much more contagious. It's also substantially less severe than earlier versions. And while vaccines may not prevent infection, they have so far done quite well in preventing worst case scenarios. In fact, in 2022, there are even some reasons for optimism. New COVID drugs will hit the market and change how we treat sick people while also limiting deaths and hospitalizations. We can even expect the pandemic to soon become endemic for most advanced industrialized economies. That means living with the virus. But that optimistic picture does not apply everywhere, like in China. Up until now, President Xi Jinping's zero COVID strategy has worked wonders for Beijing. Lockdowns and tight border controls have kept coronavirus under control. But that success is unlikely to survive this new highly transmissible form of the virus. To make matters worse, China's vaccines use older technology and so far have been much less effective than mRNA jabs found in the West. That combined with the zero COVID approach means virtually none of China's populations has the antibodies necessary to protect them against Omicron. And without an mRNA vaccine of their own, though they are working on one, China can expect larger outbreaks leading to more severe lockdowns and in turn, greater economic disruption. It's the last thing that President Xi wants as China heads toward the Winter Olympics and what's expected to be his third term in office. Chinese leadership seem unfazed though, and it's clear that Xi plans on staying the zero COVID course. State-run newspaper China Daily clearly wasn't thrilled with my take on all this, as you can see in this political cartoon. I think that's supposed to be me, the little guy in the middle, but he looks more like rich Uncle Pennybags from Monopoly. But how China handles Omicron has global ramifications, and things could soon get a lot uglier. Staffing and material shortages there will mean more empty shelves in other parts of the world. Pent-up demand will also lead to persistent and high inflation, which in turn will create greater inequality and political instability. Has the world's most successful policy battling the virus, that's China's, suddenly become the least effective? And is there anything the rest of the world can do to prepare for the failure of zero COVID policies in 2022? I tackle this and more with Yan Zhang Wang. He's senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations and director of the Center for Global Health Studies at Seton Hall University. Here's our conversation. Yan Zhang Wang, thank you so much for joining us on G Zero World. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. 
Talk to us a little bit about what China's zero COVID policy is. Well, that policy, I think, has been formally in place, you know, after March 2020, when China essentially contained the spread of the COVID virus uh, in Wuhan. So they want to sustain the achievements they made. Uh, so they launched that uh, um, up a strategy uh, with the um, attempts to contain any sporadic outbreaks. Uh, so that strategy was first tested in the summer of 2020 in Beijing, uh, when there was like a small number of outbreaks, which were immediately followed by mass testing, aggressive contact tracing, quarantine, and then sealing of neighborhoods. You know, so that becomes the standard right, playbook for other localities to follow in uh, containing the virus spread ever since. We were obviously um, very skeptical of data that was coming out of China in the early days after they had obscured uh, the human-to-human -human transmission uh, to the World Health Organization about numbers of cases and even deaths in Wuhan. Do you feel quite comfortable and confident that the numbers of cases and deaths that the Chinese government has been reporting more recently are accurate? It is overall, this number is trustworthy, right? Uh, especially if you consider that local leaders, you know, facing strong pressures, right, uh, to reset the cases to zero. So if we like, oh, uh, one more case is found, you know, when they claim, you know, there's zero infections in the locality, if one more case is found, he's going to be in big trouble, right? So uh, I think after March 2020, uh, these numbers on the infection and on the uh, death not at all, uh, it's overall uh, trustworthy. So what that implies is that very, very few Chinese to date have actually gotten COVID. There are very few Chinese with antibodies uh, against natural antibodies uh, against this disease. Well, exactly. Well, this is where the risk, right, the, uh, is right, when China is facing by right, these looming Omicron threat because you have such a large vulnerable population, right? A uh, few of them develop a natural immunity because they're not exposed to the virus. And then you talk about the vaccines, but despite the very high vaccination rate, we talk about 86% of people fully vaccinated, but uh, we know the vaccines are not effective in terms of preventing new infections. You know, so, you know, the antibody levels, right, there is, is in the entire country is very low, you know, so, you know, when you sustain that approach of zero COVID for too long, you're going to expect this so-called immunity gap is going to become even larger, right, between China and the uh, outside world. And that uh, would be very dangerous, you know, consider, you know, what happened in 16th century, right, when the conquistadors uh, arrived in the new world, and that uh, immunity gap, you know, contribute to the death, the mass die off of the indigenous population. So what do you think is going to happen in China over the coming months? Because we, we know that Omicron is vastly more transmissible than Delta and other previous variants. And yet the Chinese policy is orienting at stopping precisely that. Yeah, I think the coming month will be crucial, right? The, because uh, for the government, they are not, you're not going to expect them to abandon the zero COVID strategy. But indeed, you're going to see them to double down on the campaign against the, uh, the virus. Uh, and in the meantime, they're facing a variant that is so highly transmissible right? It uh, makes the existing approach, right, uh, very difficult, right, uh, to achieve its objective, you know, resetting cases to zero. And the cost, right, associated with that approach will become, I would say, exponentially higher. So, you know, if the existing approach, especially if it fails to contain the spread of the new variant and leads to the explosion, explosion of the case in the country, you know, that is basically why right, this 
means that the the uh, uh, the China will be in a very experiencing a devastating impact of the new variant. This is a policy that is identified very closely with the president of China, Xi Jinping. Um, how far do you think this potentially goes if they get explosive case transmission? Well, if they indeed get uh, this explosive, right, that this the cases by the, in the country, well, that is tantamount to to basically uh, suggest that the, this approach, right, is done, right, it's over, right, it's no, it has to be abandoned. Uh, but, uh, you know, and China certainly will suffer the short term pains, right? The, and potentially there could be social political implications, you know. But if they can model through the crises, right, the, that might take like a couple of weeks, you know, before the whole country is being exposed, right? Uh, so they, they, they might be actually uh, uh, in much better shape, right? They learn, uh, learning to coexist with the virus. So, the, in other words, you know, it's possible that taking the pain, as difficult as it would be, uh, might be preferential to trying to maintain this zero COVID policy where you have to continue to lock down and lock down more and more, where the economic costs, both in China and globally, are going to be much larger. But exactly. Well, so this is essential about this trade-off between the short-term pain and the long-term pain. In my opinion, right, I think the long-term pain would uh, be a, a problem for China, considering the social economic cost and the impact on China's uh, uh, foreign relations. So if you were advising the Chinese government right now, would you be telling them to jettison the zero COVID policy? Absolutely, I think, but uh, I think it's the timing is not good for now because of the Winter Olympics, right? There is around the corner. So, but uh, I would say after the end of the uh, uh, Winter Olympics, there is a policy window that the Chinese uh, government should seize upon in terms of ter- uh, lowering people's expectations, you know, teaching people uh, to correctly, right, the, the understand what the, this new vi- uh, this this COVID virus is, including the uh, the new variant, and also no longer right the, the uh, frame the risks, you know, the the the, the virus as like a you know horrible, you know, so dangerous problem uh, to China. Uh, and in the meantime, you know, started to uh, approve by the, the new the MIA vaccines to use them as booster shots, especially on immunosuppressed population. Uh, and if uh, the new antiviral drugs become available, I think it will also help. But you don't think that is going to happen? It's not going to uh, be like, you know, the government formally announced the end of the policy. They just uh, quietly abandoned it or replaced it with the new policy. And people seem to be fine with that. So, Yan Zhang, I mean, in a matter of weeks, uh, China is going to be hosting the Beijing Olympics. And I mean, my God, if, if any of these athletes end up showing up with COVID, uh, I mean, you know, what kind of a message is that going to be sending to the Chinese people who are dealing with these incredibly repressive measures at home? Well, I think that uh, they're, they're confident that the, those the um, precaution measures they just announced will be sufficient to minimize new infections in the bubble and also to minimize the exposure, right, of the Chinese people uh, to the new variant, you know. So they certainly, they have draw, you know, they just, they, uh, lessons from the uh, the Tokyo, uh, the uh, Summer Olympics, you know, to try to fix the loopholes, you know, like, uh, you know, uh, the the, uh, in the Tokyo games, you know, that the people, even when they are not, they were not fully vaccinated, could still, right, uh, uh, participate. But now what China basically told them, you have to be fully, fully vaccinated. Otherwise, you have to uh, spend uh, uh, three weeks in China before you can enter the bubble, right? So people also, uh, those participants are not allowed to leave the bubble before the games are over. So they hope uh, that they, they, these measures will right, uh, be effective, you know, even though there might be like, uh, you know, small outbreaks or new infections, it's going to be confined in the bubble. The Chinese president has not left the country since January of 2020. Do you feel that Chinese leaders, Chinese elites, are themselves becoming more isolated from the rest of the world? And do you think that 
some of that may end up permanent even after we're done with the pandemic? Well, I think the, the last thing China, China wants or Chinese leaders want is to be isolated at the international stage, right? Uh, I mean, diplomatically, economically, and politically. Uh, so, you know, I, I think while, especially when other countries learn to live with the virus, right, and that the pandemic's becoming an endemic, right, uh, I, I think the, the, the China cannot, well, we'll find that, that the zero tolerance strategy unsustainable, right? Well, it may be still able to sustain it for another like one year, but uh, you know, that I doubt it's going to take uh, you know, longer than one or two years. So eventually they have to abandon that approach anyway. Opening up then becomes, I think, a more likely um, uh, prospect. Yan Zhang Wang, incredibly important topic. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you, Yan. If you happen to live in New York and are one of the city's 18% of unvaccinated residents, shame on you. No, now might be a good time to go get jabbed and not just because of Omicron. In late December, now former New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio announced the city would start offering gift cards, not to mention free roller coaster rides on Coney Island and trips to the Statue of Liberty to those who get their shots. It's not just the Big Apple. As infections jump, vaccination incentive programs are being brought back around the world. For example, in vaccine-hesitant Missouri, the Show Me State, they've earmarked $11 million for gift cards worth 100 bucks each. That's 110,000 cards, just did that math. Even Vermont, which has consistently had one of the best performing vaccination programs in the country, is awarding schools with per pupil bonuses. That's right, one for each eye, if they hit rates higher than 85%. However, cash prizes are kind of vanilla compared to some of the other incentives that we've seen globally. For example, the mayor of San Luis in the Philippines is encouraging residents to get vaccinated against COVID-19 by raffling off a cow every month until August 2022. Pretty good. Hong Kong enticing their residents to get vaccinated with more than $15 million in prizes that included a $1.4 million apartment, gold bars, and a Tesla. Who needs democracy? Meanwhile, back in November, one Austrian brothel called the Fun Palace, yeah, you hear that right, offered patrons 30 minutes of free hanky-panky to anyone who got vaccinated on the site. And they say Austrians are boring. Well, maybe Austria remains one of Western Europe's least vaccinated countries. It's unclear how effective any of these programs, even Austria's, have actually been in increasing vaccination rates. One recent study from the Boston University School of Medicine found that incentive programs in several states, including one in Ohio that entered people into a $1 million lottery, failed to move the needle, as it were. Some experts argue that a more effective way to increase rates is for officials to make daily life more difficult for the unvaccinated. France's President Emmanuel Macron certainly seems to agree. That's our show this week. Come back next week, and if you like what you see, and I know you do, or maybe if you just want a cow because you just got vaccinated, I know where you can get that cow. Why don't you take a minute and sign up for G-Zero's most excellent morning newsletter. It's called Signal. You'll get a cow.